Hey there, it's Sal Good Sam, aka Max Douglas. Uh, I'm comic creator and the co-creator of Dracula, Son of the Dragon with Mark Sable. You're listening to True North Country Comics Podcast. Welcome to the True North Country Comics Podcast, dedicated to promote Canadian comic book and graphic novel creators and supporters. I'm John Swinimer. If you want to drop me a line, you can contact me at john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. On this episode, I chat with Sal Good Sam about Dracula, Son of the Dragon, and more at the 2022 Montreal Comic Arts Festival. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. It's also available on the True North Country Comics channel on YouTube. I invite you to like and subscribe. Sal Good, a.k.a. Max Douglas, grew up in Toronto but now resides in Montreal. He's been a freelance artist for nearly three decades, working mainly in comics, animation, and illustration, with a side order of graphic design, concept art, and mural painting. For the last five years, he's been a part-time art teacher. He started publishing comics and zines in the late 80s, and started making comics professionally in the early 90s. His work has been published notably by Image, IDW, Marvel, and DC, and outside of comics, his clients have included the Criterion Collection, Bravo TV, Nokia, Nelvana Studios, and Fox, among many others. One of his current projects is Mind Engine. For MCAF, he will showcase his illustrative work in Dracula, Son of the Dragon, written by Mark Sable. Dracula, Son of the Dragon is described as the blood-soaked epic of the real-life Vlad the Impaler's transformation into the vampire Dracula that's part historical fiction, part horror fantasy. And so, without further ado, here's my chat with Sal Good Sam about Dracula, Son of the Dragon, and more at the 2022 Montreal Comic Arts Festival. So, Sal Good Sam, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. Ah, it was my pleasure. Appreciate your time. Before we get started, though, want to ask you, what's on your bedside reading table? What are you reading today? <laughs> so, I actually, like, pretty much exclusively listen to podcasts going to oh. sleep, but I've, I've, I, 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 what I'll opt in is like a book I just got ordered because I like I was listening to um, a news report about an artist that I was uh, amazed by back when I was like, I guess it would have been like 18. And he was in the news for making fake British pounds with a ballpoint pen hmm. when he was in the UK. And then uh, he would take him to shops and when he went to buy something, he'd go to pay with it without saying anything. And then people would notice. And it's like one side's not even drawn on. So it's not even trying to be <laughs> convincing. And he'd say, well, I'm an artist and I'll, I'll pay for the thing with very little money on if you'd like. Or you could take this and give me the appropriate change and the receipt. And that'll go into an art show that I'm doing. And so you would fo- you'd Polaroid the, the bills and then t- the, the, the exhibit would be the, the photo of the drawing and the money he got back with receipts. Oh. And then the galleries would go out and buy them for inflated prices, too. <laughs> so, you know, the business have caught on to this eventually. We're like, yes, bring, give us your fake money. And I, as a kid, was fascinated with forgery and counterfeit and all of that kind of stuff. I, I, I remember seeing a movie when I was really young by Orson Welles called F is for Fake. Oh, it yes, really that's right. got me, like, totally into the idea. And then I read books about it and stuff and thought about it seriously. as like it was actually my first I'm going to be a professional artist career notion as like a i guess like 15 year old i didn't i obviously went off into like commercial illustration and comics and stuff but it was what i was into first i was watching a documentary about that recently and they mentioned that it had work in an exhibit and there was a book and they showed the book on the on the screen and my eyes popped open as fake question mark the art of deception edited by mark jones and it's like this huge exhibit volume hardback i, I found one i don't know library clearance Oh, nice! And bought it. Cool. So that's that's uh, it's got everything like the Piltdown Man, Piltdown Man to this guy's bills that are in there, all sorts of stuff. That's fast. So I'm gonna get to like revisit a childhood fascination with forgery. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So we're here talking about the Montreal Comic Arts Festival. I know you're exhibitor this year. So with that in mind, do you have any past favorite convention or festival moments that you can share? Well, for the most of its time, it's been in a park. It's, they're switching to the street, a, a street fair now. They're like three blocks of Saint Denis in Montreal, which is quite central too. So that's great because it's going to probably mean a whole lot more just casual traffic. 
but it was in a very picturesque park, literally feet from my house, like hundreds of feet, but still like uh, basically two or three blocks. So I could just grab my stuff and walk over there, um, which was always very convenient. And, you know, weather was a bit of an issue. We had these giant tents, so it was generally okay. But the first couple of years before the giant tents, occasionally if it got wet, that would be a bit anxious making. But it was always really pleasant and very scenic and, and um, a really nice atmosphere. A lot of kids, because there's schools nearby, and people just sort of going for a stroll in the park would find them. So pretty good sales, but it was a great kind of just like not your usual comics crowd. You're not at a festival that is uh, hidden away where people have to kind of intentionally go there. So you get a lot of the un- people who didn't expect to go to a comic festival walking oh, okay. in like, what's this thing at the park? Hmm. And now they're going to what's this thing in the street? So hopefully yeah. they'll work out good. So a lot of that. Um, okay. Talking to people, which actually I, like, I find for my work, I do better than with fandom crowds. TCAF is really good for me, but and a lot of festivals. And like we have a small press book festival here called Exposine. I always do really well at, but fandom cons I don't do so well at. I really like uh, FBDM or MCAF because it's a similar kind of like more diverse crowd where I sell well at and it's a nice atmosphere and it's sort of diverse and interesting. I know that sometimes you're, you're stuck behind a table, but do you ever get a chance yeah. to sort of rub shoulders with fellow creators, uh, learn new things or share ideas? Sure. Well, I mean, I actually got to help do the layout for the floor plan a couple of years back before the pandemic kind of interrupted things with the festival. And we made it so there were large pods of like, but eight tables that had our backs to each other. So you'd get a small group right there and get to know people you're tabling with for the three days. Mm-hmm. And then, um, which is it's a little more social usually than the straight lines you get in most conventions. Um, usually you just get to talk to people right next to you at, at right. most cons. Mm-hmm. And then I'd usually go up, get up, try to walk around at some point and, Used to like take videos and stuff. These days, mm-hmm. just to see what's there and see if there's any books I want to buy. So, usually, there's like lots of parties and social stuff going on. Right. <laughs> I am a hermit, so I I always mean to go to things and I'll like well, I'm interested when the Facebook event comes up, but it's rare that I actually get off my ass and go out to the thing <laughs> in the evening. Like, there's lots of cool stuff going on if you're into that. Sure, um, I might go out to some of it. Right. I just right. started to getting going now, like the the first events. Uh, just started. Great. Good. So we're talking about your exhibition at MCAF. So with that in mind, can you talk about what you'll be showcasing at the festival? So I've got a new book that's out with Dark Horse and Comixology Originals, Dracula, Son of the Dragon, something I started with Mark Sable like seven years ago. took way too long to get done. Just a long story I won't bore everyone with right now, but it got done finally a couple of years ago. And then we found a publisher kind of miraculously. Mark met uh, Chip at a show and they talked about it and he decided to advocate for it. So we got in with the Comixology original line, which was a blessing generally, but a little bit of a catch because I had run some of this stuff in some of my old revolver zines, as, like as a, excerpts in my anthology. And I had to pull those because they wanted to to have the only ones but that kind of encouraged me to go and reformat and put the stuff together into a new book which i actually like better anyway so racket just came out i should say in physical form and then i've got revolver zero is that republished collection of my other short stories and revolver one and dream life which is a graphic novel i did a while back and therefore repent which is probably one of the best-selling independent books that i've done i got a big pile of copies of those so i'll have them I'm working on other stuff that I actually wanted to have out like the last MCAF, but it's going really slow. So mm-hmm. it didn't happen last year. And it didn't happen this year. I'm not sure how long it's going to take because I've been I've been working full time in animation. But there will be uh, I'm thinking about making a small chapbook zine or something of some of the samples of the pages from that. So I might have little zine copies of that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Most people know the story of Dracula, but can you just summarize very briefly what the, your book is? Dracula, Son of the Dragons, all about? So Mark has a a scheme to connect Vlad Tepes, who's one of the people that we think Bram Stoker based Dracula on, it's generally assumed, and or Vlad the Impaler, as he's popularly known. And there's not a lot actually known about him. The historical record's pretty pretty sketchy. But given what we do know, and a lot of like, there's also a lot of what's what's currently on the record is stuff that would have been propaganda about him. Like some of the stories about him are pretty horrific. Some are probably true. Some are probably things people made up to make them look bad. And 
Mark wanted to sort of mine that and build a story that would actually dovetail with Bram Stoker's book. So how to connect those two historical figure with the, the fictional figure. And the book I did basically covers his childhood up until um, he comes into his young adulthood and comes back, is about to come back to take his kingdom. And the project was going to be a short Zuda webcomic. Actually, I don't know if, if people don't remember Zuda was a DC's attempt to do webcomics. Ah, okay. And uh, we pitched it and Zuda closed like the next month mm. <laughs> before we even heard whether they would like it or not. Yeah. So <laughs> we'd, we'd sent in a, a, a proposal and uh, Mark wanted to keep doing it. So we ended up expanding on that and we were going to do like a 60 page graphic novel when we had a Kickstarter seven years ago. It's blown up to 80 pages and over 100 when you conclude all the back matter. Mark's got like extensive historical footnotes that go over like key pages and scenes and all the historical information he was able to to mine. But then he's turned that into a story of like family tragedy and political intrigue in uh, the amongst the, the the boyars of Transylvania. Hopefully it's interesting. I was worried it was going to come out for a while there because there was a lot of uh, uncertainty. But then uh, Comixology did the deal with Dark Horse. And so now they've gotten all those the originals are getting into print now. Yeah, that's so great. That's they look great. To, yeah, fantastic. That's good stuff. I want to switch gears a wee bit and talk about the tools used to create your art. I wonder if you could walk me through your workflow. Well, so the, the workflow and the tools are kind of two different things to me because I've used the same sort of workflow for the last 20 years. But the tools I've used in it are have varied, especially in the last three years, which, in which partially because of the pandemic. Like, so I've been slowly working up to doing more digital drawing about four or five years ago, and I've gotten a a smaller drawing tablet monitor, an XP pen, so it's like a, a a Cintiq but half the price. I was getting used to it, but I wasn't totally comfortable with it. I'd have I've had a Wacom like just a dumb tablet you don't have it doesn't have a screen in it since the 90s but i would always just edit my work that way but i did a lot of it on paper and in which case it was a lot of it was with pigment pens and ink and brushes and pencils and graphite and ink wash and watercolor and the kitchen sink um <laughs> it was basically whatever i felt like depending on the stuff i was doing at the time i also like kind of playing with style mm-hmm. and so for me there are different aspects of style from the forms you use and, you know, the line uh, expression. And then a lot of that's constrained by the tools you use. So I would pick a certain couple of pens to use for one story because it would maintain a consistent kind of line quality or switch to brushes for another one. Like I did the entirety of Wonder Woman versus the Red Menace in uh, that was like 99, all with a Pentel brush pen because I wanted kind of a nice brushy vintage look to the comic. So recently... I was doing some illustration work, and it involved a lot of corrections, and I decided to try just drawing it digitally. This was just before the pandemic. It's actually pretty cool. It was a coloring book for a pot company. So Hmm. (laughs) it's very entertaining, but you're drawing pot buds that are giant with tiny little curly, cuey, leafy things all over the place. So a lot of detail, and they kept wanting revisions. They were paying enough to make it well worth it, Mm -hmm. but it was much more efficient just to do it directly on the tablet and doing the 12 illustrations for the coloring book kind of gave me that like x number of hours you need to get to the point where you just don't think about the tool you're using anymore and you can just draw so because before that i always felt awkward drawing on the tablet and then i started working on a comic directly on it dream life that i had done the first half of years ago uh, as a graphic novel all analog so ink on paper with wash and graphite and I tried to recreate the look of those media in a digital comic and started doing pages for Dream Life Book 2. And then I was kind of playing around. I started doing some other stuff. And then the pandemic happened. And I had been teaching up until that point and uh, part-time. And that left me a lot of time to work on my comics. But the teaching sort of slowed down. And I needed to find something to make more money. I'd been thinking about making the shift either into animation again, which I'd done in the 90s, or possibly going into things like concept art. Mm. And I had a friend at a local studio who was working on Ephesus for Family, and they needed to crew up. So it was like an opportunity just fell in my lap, and I sent to my work and ended up becoming prop and character supervisor for season five of Ephesus for Family. Oh, that's and, great. And there you go. Yeah, it was really cool. It was a great job to get back into animation on just because it was this like raunchy thing from the 70s, which is the era I grew up in. I'm basically the same age as the, the show creators, so... Uh, I got all the in jokes. Um, <laughs> that's made 
even more of my day on the tablet because that was all digital. So I've just progressively gone to more and more and more digital workflow. At this point, it's basically 100%. I've got a, a Galaxy Tab 7 FE, uh, which is a great kind of, uh, it's like iPod, uh, iPad right. alternative mm-hmm. uh, with a pencil. Really nice drawing, and it's got Clip Studio on it. And oh, I work okay. in Clip Studio a lot now as a drawing program. Mm-hmm. I don't actually use much of its comics purpose-built features. I like drawing my own panels, and I don't like lettering in it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a great rendering program Mm -hmm. so i use it to draw in a lot and sometimes photoshop for for text layout um if it's going to be like more of a graphical like when i'm doing props as work as well and want to do the lettering for my comics which is unusual most people go with like illustrator or something but i actually prefer the tools in in photoshop for my lettering i guess process wise i usually write a script nowadays sometimes i might think about a story as a couple of visuals so i'll do a couple drawings uh, I, did, I just finished inking on the first four of, of eight pages uh, for a, a wordless story inspired by the pandemic that was all kind of like, was inspired by funny ideas that happened to me, but I'm setting it in like this weird science fiction future. And that was all sketches in my notebook. I had these key scenes I wanted to do and I had to come up with a sequence to connect them. <laughs> mm. So I started thumbnailing and coming up with what kind of events can I can tie these sequences to. And then... Most of the time, I'm writing text, like a script. I usually start with, like, kind of short-form plot points and then expand out. And then when I start doing thumbnails, then I'll start, once I've got some thumbnails down or pencils, I'll start writing drafts of dialogue. And it kind of goes back and forth. The final version of the dialogue is the one that I write when I'm doing the word balloons. Cutting a lot at that point because it's in the art. I don't need it. Or I just come up with a more efficient way to say it. And I'm also frequently, like... I'm not terribly wordy, but like I talk a lot, but I don't write a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm often trying to see if I can cut it down a little more, but yeah. Oh, that's good. The thumbnails is usually when I lay out my, my lettering a bit, so I have an idea of I have, I have room, but I'm not always so efficient at that. So <laughs> it gets you get it done. That's the main thing. Yeah. I've kind of shifted to doing only my own stuff recently, like just writing as well. I don't want to work with other writers anymore. And part of that's because I, I really enjoy the process when, I don't have to stop and wait for somebody else or, or worry about changing things because it's going to hurt someone else's feeling I'm cutting their idea. I just want to do all the stuff so that I can then be kind of free for all. And that's kind of the most fun that I've had every time I've done that. So it's just a very organic kind of it rolls forward till it's finished. Sure. I've heard from some people who have been in your situation where they've they've done animation and comic books. And mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, when I ask them what's their preference, they usually say comic book creation only because of what you just said. Uh, typically in animation, yeah. you're working with a team of people and you got to hand off stuff. Whereas a comic book that you own, like you're doing the writing and the illustrating, that's a singular project that you alone can you know focus on. Well, Is but- that true? Yeah, the, I mean, the caveat is for personal work. For personal work, I much rather work, make comics. Animation se- seems cool, but it's a mountain of work. And I could, I guess, be the director for an animation project, but it w- I would have absurd budget and time demands. Um, I don't think anyone would want to work with me in that capacity. I don't know. If it, it, and this is for my ideas. If I want to take my story ideas and put them on a screen as animation, I'd be insane. I could, I've heard stories about, um, oh, what's his name again? Did like Spirited Away and stuff. Miyazaki? Yes, Miyazaki, who's like talented, but apparently like a nightmare to work with. Really? Like, oh, I people love that. him and admire him. They work yeah. with him. But he's a real, real grouch and like very demanding. Hmm. So. <laughs> Well, it show, uh, the, the work shows for itself, but yeah, getting yeah. there to that end point, yeah, could be a bit of a trouble. Yeah. Well, and it, I just you hear that about director types in general, and it's an intense job. I'm actually I'm familiar with it. My mother does is an animation director, actually, so I can totally see how I could do it. But I I would only want to do it on stuff that I don't care that much about because mm-hmm. there's so much compromise with clients and budgets and time, and then. For comics, it's a thing where I don't want to compromise. So right. yeah. because I do care about it. Uh, whereas animation, I actually really like it as a job where I'm just going to check in and to do the job they need. Mm-hmm. And if they want to change whether I agree with it or not, it's not important. I just do it. Right. Um, I can check out at the end of the day and feel good about what I did and not worry too much about the end product. You know, having having done the props on, on season five of F was really great because I do enjoy it, but I don't expect that to be always the norm but it's right. 
if if you have that disconnect from it, I think something like animation is really fun. Like it's one a great way to make a living. Okay, makes sense. You mentioned before that you're a former art teacher. You were doing it yep. during the pandemic. So I know you're not doing it now, but it, do you have one piece of advice for someone who's making their own comic book? What would that be? I don't. I mean, I have way more than one piece of advice. I know, I know. But, but if, if I could come up with one, yeah. I think the, my universal starting one is start small. It's a really complicated medium. Find something you can do to constrain it. So the classic one, I used, used to start my making comics classes with only doing a couple weeks worth of like daily three panel uh, diary strips. And diary is just a suggestion. They could do any genre they wanted, but keep the three to four panels. Just do a rough sketch. You're just thumbnailing out an idea. But getting into the routine daily process of like write, thumbnail out like the layouts and think about how it's going to block, action's going to block and what the character's doing, get a little pantomime in there. And start flexing that muscle to see if you 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 have any to start with and working on developing it and getting into the routine of doing it. It's very time consuming medium. So we get students coming in all the time like, I've got a graphic novel I want to do. Have you ever done a comic? <laughs> no. Have you drawn before? Not really. Well, we're going to put that on hold and we're going to start with these little short strips. And if you want to play with character ideas from your graphic novel, that's fine. But don't try to do parts of it. Just put it aside. And we're going to do a thing over here to just get some exercise with the tools and then build up. And for some people, that building up happens really fast. They figure they love it. They've got an affinity for it. They have the I think like the biggest thing that's important to making good comics isn't like talent or something in the classic creative sense, but the tenacity to keep at it. Right. Because if you do that, like up is part of the process and you learn from the ups and you get better. So you can, that'll account f- even at the playing field and everything else if you keep at it. So start small. Don't kill yourself in the first giant mega project and feel it out. Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. That's very good mm-hmm. advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we've been talking about Dracula, Son of the Dragon, and some other things you'll have at MCAF, but yeah. do you have any other up-and-coming projects that you can talk about? I want to build a bus. <laughs> really? Yes. It's. I don't have any art comics. I'm joining on Makerspace and learning welding, and I want. We're, I have a 10-year plan to build a build out a schoolie with my wife. Oh, okay. Um, to, to probably live in or something. One of those, uh, I've seen those YouTube videos where they take an existing school bus and turn it into like a, a, a like a livable space, a van yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I've cool. got blueprints. They're actually nice. in that, uh, they're in mineage and there's a bus bus blueprint in there if you look through the stuff I sent you samples of. Okay. That's that's the uh, an early, totally ignorant. I have no idea what I'm ta- getting myself into. Kind of pie in the sky version. And as I as I go, I've got to also learn. Like, we don't know how to drive yet. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> we're important. See, folks, we've avoided having to. I'm sure I can figure it out. I grew up with a father who was a me- bike mechanic, but I just never got around to it. And mm-hmm. so we have to do that. I have to uh, learn a bunch of trades. I want to re-familiarize myself with, like, basic uh, mechanical stuff. I knew a bit of that when I was young. And uh, that's kind of, like, the fun long-term five to ten year plan project wow yeah that's an adventure in <laughs> itself you should document that that yeah. would be really tremendous to see that's for sure not a, youtube's got it covered though i have to do it i guess just do it in a comic or something but hey that's a, right, that's... labor intensive it's kind of crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> well it could be uh one of those uh, photo uh, essay ones you never know yeah that could work out the more serious answer should have been mind engine which is this the reincarnation of my personal anthology project mm-hmm. but i'll actually be having things like that in it like whatever stuff along with comics that i put in that i'm involved with i'm going to be putting into mine engine super good stuff well we, we've talked about mcaf but i'm wondering do you have any plans to attend any other events this year uh i don't know <laughs> uh mcaf is very easy because it's so close i may do other montreal shows i'm not sure i have the interest in traveling right now partially because of like the, the day job uh, so i have to book vacation time and stuff uh, so it's a little depending on that, and I haven't really planned this year. Um, but I think mostly too, like I'm, it's the one, the few shows I want to go are quite long distance travels. So at the moment, probably not unless I figure out a way to budget a plane ticket. Well, with all the stuff that you have on the go, do you have a website where you recommend that people go to yes. find out about your current and your future projects? So like Google Sal Good Sam, and there'll be tons of social media stuff too, but also uh, salgoodsam.com. And all of the other things 
I'm mostly active on Instagram and Facebook, I'd say. I post a lot of images to Instagram and I and I'm on Facebook a lot. Great. Those are all the questions I have for you, but I'm wondering, is there something I didn't ask that you'd like to get across in this interview? Oh, buy my books. <laughs> and, and, and buy more comics. And buy my and comics specifically. And come see you at MCAF. <laughs> yes, and come see us at MCAF. Thanks to Sal Good Sam for the chat. You can discover more about Sal Good Sam on Twitter at Sal Good and on Instagram at Sal Good Sam and online at salgoodsam.com. And thanks to you for listening to the True North Country Comics Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to and like this podcast on Apple Podcasts, and please leave a good rating. Also check out the truenorthcountrycomics.com website, and follow along on Twitter at True North Comics. True North Country Comics is now on YouTube. Please like and subscribe to that video channel. Please send your feedback to john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. Thanks again for listening, and come back soon for another episode. Bye for now. Truth Country Comics Podcast is copyright Truth Country Comics, copyright 2022.